Alright, so here's the situation. I remember when I was younger, I would wake up on Saturday mornings and watch the classic 90s Spider-Man. Venom? More like scary. I one time had a nightmare that I got eaten by Venom. I'm not into Vore, don't at me. Whoa, that's a little kinky. <laughs> Whoa, just chill. Then when I got a bit older, around 9, I watched The Spectacular Spider-Man, an incredible show with amazing animation and a fantastic story which truly cemented my love for the wall crawler. But, there's a but. There was one show I used to watch as well, Spider-Man of course, I had the DVDs. And that show was the MTV Spider-Man Show! You remember MTV? Music, television? Hell yeah, there's good vibes all around, let's see what the show is like. Yeah, this show actually traumatized me. MTV Spider-Man or Spider-Man the Animated Series was a show I used to watch and was honestly kind of scared by. The mature tone and unsettling nature was off-putting, yet addicting at the same time. I remember Electro and how absolutely scary he was, but why was he scary? Why is the show so good yet so uncomfortable at times? You don't have to answer that, those are rhetorical questions. So today, let's talk about Spider-Man, the new animated series, and figure out what makes it tick. Spider-Man is an incredible hero, a selfless individual, he keeps us safe. But he really can't keep us safe online, now can he? Well, that's why NordVPN exists, baby. NordVPN is a service that can help you with online privacy, website access, and online security. Winner of 2021's Best VPN Overall by VPN Mentor, NordVPN is an amazing VPN. Now there's always people out there who want to steal your information, even your internet service provider can check and log your browsing history. Now you can't beat the crap out of them like Spider-Man can, but you can beat them at their own game, by protecting yourself online. NordVPN sends your online traffic through a remote server within a worldwide network of secure VPN servers. So your real IP address is changed, and whatever you look up online is completely snoop-proof. And remember, you can always change your location on NordVPN and easily access content that is blocked in your country. There's also a 30-day money-back guarantee, you can use NordVPN on up to 6 devices, and you can go to nordvpn.com slash browntable to get 70% off a 2-year plan, plus a month free. That's a great deal, and right now NordVPN is celebrating its birthday, so until March 10th you'll get all this and a surprise gift if you use the link. So get protected by going to nordvpn.com slash browntable and getting a 70% off 2 year plan plus a month free, and if you get NordVPN before the 10th of March, you'll get a free surprise gift. I don't know about you, but I remember Spider-Man the Animated Series really standing out when I was younger. It was just so different from other shows I watched. And it makes sense. MTV isn't a channel that's exclusively for kids. One of the upsides of being a show on MTV was the fact that the creators had less limitations on what they could create. Spider-Man the New Animated Series was a series that was developed by Brian Michael Bendis, Morgan Gendel, and Marsha Griffin. The series was sold as a continuation of the 2002 film Spider-Man, with the intention of continuing the story of Peter Parker immediately after the end ending of the film. But it pretty much makes itself irrelevant as the ending of the show doesn't line up with the start of Spider-Man 2. I don't want to cause any more pain here. I can't live with that burden any longer. So it's time for me to say goodbye, Spider-Man. Pizza time. It's not like it's the show's fault though. It was canceled. Just <laughs> Just like Spectacular Spider-Man was cancelled? <laughs> but being attached to the Raimi films wasn't always the case. The show was actually supposed to be an adaptation of the Ultimate Spider-Man comics by Brian Michael Bendis. So, you can guess why he's attached to the show. Uh, we started gathering art and reference, and at that point they brought in Brian Michael Bendis, who was a writer who works on Ultimate Spider-Man. He did a pilot script. This pilot script was very edgy, it was very different, it was very much based on uh, the work that he had been doing in his Marvel comic, and with some of the art that uh, I and my team were starting to develop, we shopped the show around. But the main takeaway with Spider-Man the new animated series was that it was going to be different from the rest. Gone were the days of no punching and only throwing, these days Spider-Man beats the shit out of people. Oh, and also the show is 3D animated. <laughs> Having Spider-Man be 3D animated was a tough task from the get-go. This is 2003, not 2010. But Mainframe Studios isn't incompetent. They've done Max Steel. Heck, they've done Beast Wars Transformers. Remember Beast Wars Transformers? I actually, I actually don't. But if you do, hell yeah, Beast Wars. After we made the decision to make it a computer animated show, 
we needed to find out which studio could work with us on the show. And we set up basically an open audition for studios. Uh, what we were looking for was this tune styled line where the exterior perimeter of the character would have a line around it. It needed to, to look like an illustration. And the studio that um, won the contract, hands down, was Mainframe. One of the requirements that Sony had for us was to populate the city of New York. And if we couldn't populate the city, we wouldn't get the series. So we had to come up with an idea to create render-friendly, multiple-person sets. The show put a lot of effort into making the characters look two-dimensional, even though it's a CG endeavor. It's a process called cell shading, but they went further than that. They had to discover new ways to have the characters be shaded and have it work. They had to emulate the comic book style, but never go overboard with the black line work that comic books have. I'm pretty sure this was something Brian Michael Bendis wanted for his Ultimate Spider-Man show. The look is reminiscent of the video game Ultimate Spider-Man, and this toony, cell shaded look stayed a part of the show even when it became disconnected from the Ultimate Comics. And honestly, as it is now, it's um. <laughs> But then again. Animation can go from good to bad pretty quick, which makes for a crazy watching experience. For the time, it was amazing. And not just that, even though the visuals are dated, the way the show is presented is absolute sex. The show is style, it is color, it has a genuine visual direction unlike the Spider-Man 2017 show. And you can tell everyone cared. Every single frame of this show was crafted with meticulous care, because everyone working on this project wanted to make the best Spider-Man show possible. You basically have to localize different geometry within the body. Spider-Man is our first full-scale production that's in 2D. With our shader on, it's the difference is night and day. One positive thing this show has that the Raimi movies don't really have is that the characters genuinely feel like they're in college. It isn't just that the characters go to college, they behave like college goers for the most part, and I like that about the show. Peter's always late to stuff, you know, he's always coming. Wanna come? How about if I come late? Coming. Coming. Coming! So let's talk about the first episode I ever watched, right? And that episode is called The Party. That sounds fun, right? What could go wrong? <laughs> I'm pretty sure the party scarred me for life, but it also helped me realize the potential that One Note characters have. Take someone like Electro, pretty average, right? But this show made him so complex and sad. It's way, way, way more tragic than any other Electro interpretation I've seen personally, and I love that about it, as twisted as that sounds. In this show, Max Dillon is bullied, constantly, and Max is almost the protagonist of the episode. Or at least, the deuteragonist, as we follow him throughout the entire episode and begin to understand what he wants. He wants to become a cool guy, he wants to join this fraternity in college, but what he needs, what he needs is just a friend. Someone to care about him, but he thinks what he needs is to be cool. He goes to this party where the fraternity he wants to join is gonna initiate him, but he ends up just being paintballed and humiliated publicly. I hope you all rot and die. <laughs> yeah, imagine me, five years old, uh, watching that. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's definitely not something a five-year-old should be watching. And so, a sad Max, a uh, Mad Max, if you will, finally sees someone call to him, uh, in the form of a sign, so this guy is pretty down bad. Once he reaches the sign, he realizes it was never calling to him, he gets angry, he destroys the sign, and gets electrocuted, and thus becomes... Oh god. So Electra is born, and he's terrifying. Like, look at him. Holy sh**. He literally kills, deadass kills the leader of the fraternity, or whatever. I've never been in a fraternity, I don't know the code words they use, but he looks like the boss, so whatever, the boss dies. Electro then starts maniacally attempting to kill everyone, kind of like in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, but actually good, and then Spider-Man appears to stop him. The entire episode is pretty much showcasing how bullying can be traumatic, and how by going too far, people can just break, man. It's really sad stuff because it's not a happy ending, and that's a staple of the show. It's actually an aspect I don't like too much, but more on that later. I will say, if you've ever played Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions before, you'll realize that Neil Patrick Harris voiced Spider-Man in that game. But do you know why? It's because he voiced Spider-Man in this show. We also had to cast. We had to find voice actors who could bring our characters to life. We had over 200 actors audition for the, the key roles in our pilot episode. And I thought it was a great, it's just a great discipline to use just your vocal inflection to try and make a character work. And uh, Spider-Man came around, I auditioned for it, and. Uh and ended up getting it. I, I, I didn't even expect to get it, but it worked out real well. 
And while Neil Patrick Harris is easily the best voice actor in the show for the most part, he still fails to make himself sound... alive, if that makes sense? A problem the show has is that everyone sounds kinda dead. It's early in the semester, bro. No snow? No. You. Those costume nuts are all a menace if you ask me. If this turbo jet did purposely help all those people, he gets my vote. Agree or disagree? Like, dude, please, give me some inflections or something. You're not a robot. The show in general is a little weird at times. Like, there's the turbo jet episode where people who live in a certain building are protesting its demolition. This demolition is being funded by Oscorp and Spider-Man has to beat up this dude who allies himself with the protesters. But to make him clearly evil, they have to make him an absolute dick who doesn't care about the people he's defending. And then the episode ends with the residents of the building just straight up moving. Like, wow, alright, alright then. There's the Kingpin episode, which is dope, I guess, mostly because he's voiced by the king, Michael Clark Duncan, rest in peace, so yeah, maybe this show does take place in the Daredevil universe. Wake me up, wake me up but they make Kingpin a literal fat joke. Like, it's not just Spider-Man making fat quips to make him lose his edge. Kingpin is portrayed as a fat joke throughout the entire episode, complete with a burger antenna on his car and this scene. Anyone else want coffee? <laughs> what the fuck? The show is clearly dated, but for every mediocre episode, we get an absolute amazing episode, like the Electro one. The Lizard is in this show, voiced by, no joke, Rob Zombie, and they make the Lizard the scariest Spider-Man villain ever, and this is also thanks to the lighting. The lighters of the show did a fantastic job, easily able to change scenes from eerie to frenetic in a flash. The show also did this scene from Spider-Man 2 before Spider-Man 2 did. <laughs> Get out of here! Why are you helping me? Go on, go! This doesn't change anything. So, back to the show's story. It's very dark. I think the creators had a lot of freedom with this show, and that's amazing. But damn, man, so many people die on this show. Don't go! Come on. The lizard literally falls to his death. Kurt Connors is just, is just dead, dude. Oh, and he cries. He cries right before he dies. And this is Peter's response. Genus Aranei, at your service. <laughs> so basically, the show is insanely intense, and that's both good and bad. This is best exemplified by the show's two-parter finale. The series finale for this show is one of the most intense things you'll ever see. These telepathic twins attempt an escape from an armored convoy. Spider-Man arrives in usual fashion and manages to put a stop to the villains. Sadly, Craven and Silver Sable also escaped prison, and later on in the episode, Craven kidnaps Mary Jane and kills her. Peter becomes filled with rage, gets encouraged to take revenge by this this random dude, voiced by the amazing Stan Lee, though. Revenge? I would kill him with my bare hands. Good. He deserves it, doesn't he? And he goes off to kill Craven the Hunter. Wow. So, uh, that's nuts. If that wasn't intense enough, the whole episode was a lie. Yeah, it, it never happened. Because the twins at the start of the show actually managed to mind control Spider-Man. Holy sh**, right? But it gets more intense. Because in the next episode, Spider-Man starts choking Kraven, and not in the kinky way. Eventually, Spider-Man becomes big brain and figures out he's being mind-controlled, saves Mary Jane, who actually isn't dead, and one of the twins accidentally falls off a building. But that wasn't a twin. That was one of the love interests Peter had in the show, Indy Daimonji, pretty much Peter's girlfriend, and yes, one of the twins was making Peter see that it was the enemy when in fact it was not. It's like they mixed Injustice, where Superman kills Lois Lane by thinking it's Doomsday, and they also pull a Gwen Stacy. Stacy in a way, but Gwen Stacy does appear in the show, uh, through, through computer text. Anyways, Indy is now in a coma. She may never wake up. Peter goes out and finds these twins, takes the brother down, and the sister accidentally blows herself up, killing herself and her brother, in typical Spider-Man the new animated series fashion. People be dying. And so the show literally ends with Peter saying goodbye to Spider-Man. It's a Spider-Man no more arc, and it never has a resolution. And the biggest issue I have with all this is the grit and just the darkness the show oozes. I'm very sure a lot of people like this show. I like this show, but a lot prevents me from loving it. And what always stops me is the lack of optimism. There's a difference between ending your season with a dark, tragic ending, but having the rest of the season be more positive, and ending your season with a dark, tragic ending, and having the rest of the season also be tragic and dark. I don't ever feel hopeful when Spider-Man comes on screen in this show. I think it's cool, but I never feel hopeful. And I do like how it feels real and violent, but damn, Spider-Man is an optimistic character at the end of the day, but nearly every single episode ends with someone dying or getting hurt, and Peter's just 
brooding. It's kind of off-putting to me. There's an important thing Stan Lee said about not just this show, but Spider-Man and media in general. I can't even count how many other writers have written the stories, how many other artists have drawn them. Every time a new writer takes over the series, he will put his imprimatur on it. He'll, he'll give it his style. So over the years, he's changed slightly, but he's never deviated from the basic concept that he has to be a realistic, believable, empathetic, heroic character. And he's right. Every director or creator is going to have a different interpretation of Spider-Man, but the core fundamentals can't change. Because if they do, then that's no longer Spider-Man. And I don't think this show really changes too much of Spider-Man for me to no longer consider him Spider-Man or anything, but I do think this interpretation is one I don't enjoy as much as I'd like. Still though, that's my own personal opinion. A lot of people want this show to get another season, just like people want a third season of The Spectacular Spider-Man. And there's even people making a fan-made season too. So while maybe I don't fully love the show, others do. And I'm glad the show has found a place in the hearts of these fans. And the show itself has a lot of positives. The characters grow, evolve, change, those are all synonyms in a way, but whatever, please like and subscribe. You'd imagine this would be a show without much going for it, but no, Peter goes through a lot of stuff and with every episode, the characters become more fully realized. Maybe you won't like the interpretation of these characters at episode 1, but once you keep watching, you'll warm up to the way the writers wanted to portray the characters. The show is such a unique, almost experimental experience that I highly suggest you watch it. At least, the Electra episode, because it's just that crazy. Now that's thick! Thanks so much A. Nathan for the awesome Interstellar Ranger Commence fan art. It looks super dope, I sincerely adore it. Thanks so much Drifty for editing some of this video. Check out his channel, link in the description. Check out Interstellar Ranger Commence, the anime I'm making, and cop that merch! We got the Brown Table logo shirt as well as a Hope Griffin shirt. And now for the Patreon question of the video. Brandon Chesser asks, Do you plan to do multiple seasons of Interstellar Ranger Commence, or will it be a one-season story? Uh, so this was a huge thing for me. I wanted to contain season one as like its own thing, so in case, I hope it doesn't happen, but in case it absolutely totally flops, then it'll be like, oh, okay, it's a self-contained thing, it's okay if, you know, there's no more seasons. But the plan has always been for it to span multiple seasons. I've been throwing around ideas like, will it end happy, will it end depressing, will it end somewhere in the middle, you know? I don't want it to be a cry fest, but I also don't want it to be Avatar The Last Airbender, so it'd be like that, you know? But yeah, from how people are responding to the series so far, even though it's not even out, I think we'll be able to get some traction for season two. Hopefully we'll make a season so awesome that people will want more. Thanks so much for the question. Thank you all patrons so much. You guys are amazing. Now if you don't know why I'm calling you Chads, well the Chad Nation is what I call the subscribers of this channel. If you want to become a Chad and gain Spider-Man's powers, no cap, all you have to do is subscribe and hit the bell notification, baby. Thank you so much for watching the video, and I hope you come back to the table.